decided to join us this morning as we worship our God together. Uh, would you stand as we as we sing? You guys can go ahead and have a seat. We have a couple announcements for you this morning. I'm going to invite 
Kim Bouton to make his way up here. Uh, he's going to be announcing a, a pretty cool event that's coming up for the men of, of Timberline in our community uh, that you can be on the lookout for. But as he's coming, I just want to make you guys aware that today um, at 12 o'clock at Pizza Ranch on 86th Street here in Urbandale is our next newcomer's pizza. So for those of you that are newcomers that have been here just a couple times and want to find out more about our church, Pastor Gary and his family will be there. That's on us. So uh, you are welcome to join us today for pizza at Pizza Ranch. Another quick announcement for today. Just after the service at 1130 from 11 uh, to 1140, Pastor Gary will be over here in Missy O'Day in the coffee area. Um, and he will be doing our 10-minute party today. And that's just going to be an intro to Kingdom Life. So Kingdom Life is a class that we offer here that helps people find their identity and who they are in light of uh, who they are in Christ. And it's a, f a fantastic class, great material. You can meet with Pastor Gary from 1130 to 1140 to find out more about that class that's coming up here soon. So I'm going to ask Kim to just share with uh, here in a couple weeks. We have a men's event coming up, and uh, I'm sure you know all the details, and you can share that with everybody. Good morning, everyone. Wanted, uh, this is uh, basically for the guys and the boys here at Timberline. Um, we are having an event called the Timberline Combine Tailgate Event. It's going to be Saturday, um, September 30th from 4.30 to dark over at uh, Walker Johnston Park. We have a pavilion uh, reserved over there where we're going to have uh, games and food and fun. And it's an opportunity for each of you to bring your uh, favorite uh, tailgate uh, concoction that you put together and share it with everyone and see who uh, does the best with that. We're also gonna have some games uh, for all ages. It's gonna be a family-themed uh, football type of uh, event where we have uh, different things where everybody can do. Um, basically, how do you sign up? We have a table out in the foyer where you can sign up. Uh, it's for men and boys of all ages. Uh, you can invite your neighbors, your coworkers, uh, your friends, most anybody that you are uh, having uh, interaction with. And we hope you guys can come. Thanks, Kim. Hope to see you guys there. I, I intend to be there. I haven't told my wife that yet. But if, if, we, uh, if we have like some kind of competition about the cooking and stuff, does it count as cheating if I bring my wife's food? Do I have to make it myself or? Yeah, anyway. I'll, I'll bring something that Alyssa, well, she did, actually, I'm going to volunteer you right now to make something really great for the, <laughs> the men's event. Yeah, we'll see about that. So um, I'm going to ask you guys to stand. We're going to head back into worship, and I just want to bring us before our God together this morning um, in prayer. Heavenly Father, um, we are uh, your people, and we're here to sing your praises, and, uh, and we're here to declare what it is that we believe um, thank you that the gospel unites us, and uh, I, I thank you that we get to declare our, our belief in those things um, through these next few songs that we're going to sing together. I pray that um, our hearts will, will be in um, our worship today, that uh, we'll get out of our heads, and that we'll experience um, a close communion with you this morning through, through worshiping you and thanking you for what you've done through your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Judge 
and our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is in you come on descended into darkness you rose in glorious light forever seated high i believe in god our father I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. saints communion and in your holy church i believe in the resurrection when jesus comes again for i believe in the name of jesus i believe in god our father i believe in christ the son i believe in the holy spirit God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of that we can pour our hearts into this next song and, and declare together that um, above all else, um, we desire Jesus.
Please remain standing for this morning's scripture reading. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him and saw this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first followed his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip followed Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? 
Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw anything good. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree. I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Behold, I said to you, I saw you under a fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened up and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to try and do something that's never been done before. Can all of you take out your mobile phones? And I want you to just hold them up in the air. Can you all do that for me? Judges, I'd like to stand up and have a look at the, the audience. Oh my That's crazy. How are you doing that? In today's world, we're all connected through our cell phones. Mm -hmm. But what I want to show you is that we're actually all connected on a far deeper level. Simon, you'll notice that a few of the devices are still red. Yeah. I want you just to choose three of them to come and join me on stage. Pick the one that's all the way in the end. You, please. In the red. Yeah. And you. Come on. Tara, can you bring your phone as well? Can you just unlock the phone and open the calculator? OK, that's okay. great. OK, here's what I want to do. So I want you to try and guess for me. How many number one selling artists do you think Simon Cowell's had on its record label? 53. 53. Tara, could you just type in 53? 53. Yeah. All right, I'm just typing in now. Go for 53. it. And then secondly, how many millions of records do you think Mel, when she performed the Spice Girls, sold worldwide? Just go for it, millions. 102. 102. Tara, can you hit multiply? Times. Yeah, and then 102. 102. OK. OK, and next up, I want you to try and guess what year Heidi began modeling. Oh, it's a hard one. Not, sorry, I'm so bad at math. <laughs> 1970. Nope, 1980. Not when I was born. Oh, it's okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> 1987? 87, okay. Tara, can you hit multiplied? Okay. And then just 87? 87. Wonderful, okay. And then here's what we're gonna do. Um, hit the plus sign. Plus. Fantastic. Now, a little buddy told me, Harry, that you've had a lot of girlfriends. Um, but instead of just guessing, Tyra, what I want you to do is I want you to have your thumbs over the numbers. Thumbs over yeah. numbers. Now I want you to make a random guess. I want you to close your eyes and just hit maybe like seven or eight numbers. Go One, for it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, cool. Hit equals. Equals. Okay, sweet. Now I just want you to read that number out for me. Is that okay? Okay, ready? Go for it. 73 million. Okay, 73 million. 928,000. 928,000. 547. 547. Wonderful, guys. Give a round of applause for these three volunteers. Thank you. And for Tara Banks, please take a seat. Thank you. It's not over yet, is take it? Take a seat, guys. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, so we've got this random number here, but there's something bigger going on. There's something impossible. There's something magical. I want you guys to see this. I'm here on Hollywood Boulevard. It's a few hours until my audition. This number, 73,928,547. Does this mean anything to you? Thank you. What? But wait, but wait. Do you remember at the start, I said that we're all connected on a far, far deeper level? Yeah. Well, Simon, I think you'll find that you've actually had 47 number one selling artists. And Mel, you sold 85 million records with the Spice yes. Girls. Heidi, you started your career in 1992 when you won Models right. 92. 
And Howie, you and I both know that you've not had 73 girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> but that's because you married your high school sweetheart. And you've been married to her for 37 years. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to try and do something that's never been done before. Okay, let's watch this one Can more time. <laughs> there we go. All right. Uh, we'll bring the lights on up. Amazing, isn't it? Maybe some of you mathematicians can figure out how maybe that, that works, it's, it, 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 how those numbers all come together. I cannot figure it out. But one thing that I was reminded as I watched that video and as, as I prepared for this morning's text, we love it when something mind-bending is revealed to us, don't we? Well, today in our passage, we're going to continue in our journey through the Gospel of John. In fact, this is the last Sunday. We, just, we, we had decided to, to spend time in the first chapter of John's Gospel uh, with a heart of understanding how John, uh, you could call him John the Evangelist, was communicating uh, what was going on in that time. And so we, in turn, can learn what our role is in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ as he's been revealed to us and how he was revealed to others right here. Uh, specifically, how he was revealed to others in the first few days of Jesus' ministry. So there's something revealing that we're going to see today, I believe, as we look at Jesus' first days of his public ministry. And some of those uh, I think we're going to see, we're going to get to see this morning, uh, we're going to see the basics of what Jesus did as he personally invited some disciples to follow him. We're going to see that just briefly this morning. We're also going to get a chance to see in these first few verses, we're going to get to see gentlemen that you may be familiar with, uh, such as John the Baptizer. You might be familiar with him, or you might be familiar with Andrew, one of the first disciples to follow Jesus, or you might be familiar with, uh, with Philip, and how they all came to know Jesus Christ, and how they came to follow him, and to point other people to him. But I think most importantly, as we open up our Bibles this morning, or we turn in our apps to John 1, starting in verse 35, I think most importantly, we're going to see how people reveal to others who Jesus truly is. Now, over the last couple of Sundays, uh, obviously we've spent our Sundays in the first uh, portion of John 1. Uh, and in fact, it has been, what we've covered is basically two days, the first two days of Jesus' public ministries thus far. And all the farther we're going to get is today, we're going to get into days three and part of the way into day four of Jesus' public ministry. But right here this morning as we begin, there's a couple of things that we learn right away of what a faithful Christian does. There's a couple of things that we learn right away that a faithful Christian does. And I think they're worth writing down. And I, I think the first one um, began last, week, last Sunday or began the day before our text for today. And, it's, and, and if you were here with us or you joined us online, I know we had a number of hits online with last week's uh, text. If you didn't get a chance to be with us or watch it online, I invite you to go back and, and watch that online. It's on Facebook Live even right now. You can go to Facebook and find uh, previous week's uh, sermons. Uh, but there is one thing that was very clear, and, and I know that jo no doubt if John the baptizer was here with us today, he wanted you to take one thing home, and it was what he declared to all that were around. Do you remember what that was? Behold the Lamb of God who what? Takes away the sins of the world. It made a difference. Last week I have heard so many comments out of last week's message about that very thing and that what John did is what we too must do as faithful Christians. In fact, we, we can even see that right here revealed to us in the text for this morning. I want to point you right to verses 35 through 37 and, and it'll kind of catch you up with what's going on. It says here in verse 35, the next day again, John was standing with his two disciples. Okay, so, so last week, last Sunday was the day before this, and we see John the baptizer and he's standing there and and when he sees Jesus, 
uh, he sees Jesus approaching. It says he saw him coming towards him. And those words with great excitement came out of John. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Whoa! You know what? John's not done getting excited. Because today, as he's standing there with his own two disciples, it says, by the way, it says that they're John's disciples standing there with two of his own, his disciples. Look what happens. Verse 36. John sees, he looks at Jesus as he, Jesus, walks by. And John once again says, Behold the Lamb of God. You know what we should take, what we can understand from this? Is the very first thing that a faithful Christ follower does is declare Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. As a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, the first thing we ought to find ourselves doing is not gathering people upon our, around ourselves as if, as if unto ourselves, but rather we ought to be pointing people to Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Here's the problem. Well, <laughs> There's many problems, I believe, that we're going to find if we really sat down and talked about it and wrote them all out. There's a lot of problems in our world, my friends. Did anybody want to agree with that? I'm uh, here to tell you, uh, I think one of the big problems in our world is that Satan has influenced our world and the culture around us. In fact, one of the ways that he has influenced our culture so effectively is that we, uh, the world doesn't want us to declare Jesus Christ the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He doesn't want us to. In fact, it's pretty clear that, that the world around us wants, to stay, wants us to stay quiet about Jesus. You know, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, Many of you know that I am, a, a, I am a faithful NFL football fan. I love football season. I love walking out the doors this morning early on and feeling that cool breeze because, yeah, the downside, it reminds me, winter's coming in Iowa. That's a downer. But I can handle winter when I have the opportunity to enjoy some football, some good NFL football. And many of you may recall who I'm talking about here uh, a few years ago. There was a quarterback that was faithful. And to, he was a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. And every time before he would enter onto the field, or any time that there was an opportunity, he was declaring Jesus before the world by how he knelt his knee down and he prayed. That was this man's way of declaring Jesus. And not only that, when he would get interviewed at the end of a game, no matter if they won or if they lost, what would he do? He would declare to the glory of Jesus, to the world around us. And he got chastised for standing up and proclaiming Jesus Christ. But my friends, a faithful Christian needs to be bold about declaring who Jesus is to the world around us. No matter what the world says, I still believe that Jesus is still the answer that this world needs. And now the second practice that we see in a faithful Christian is one who follows after Jesus. Now, keep in mind that until Jesus walked onto the scene, John the baptizer, here we see in verse, uh, verses 35 and 36, John had disciples of his own. Basically, we could say it this way. John had men who probably lived on his every word. John had men who followed him as a teacher. Pretty evident right here. But then Jesus walks onto the scene. And what, what, what John cannot help himself but to declare is, Behold the Lamb of God. And when he declared that, immediately his disciples left following himself and turned and followed Jesus. You know, it's a good thing for John that 
That was his goal. It was evidence that what John had done is he had taught them the scriptures. It was, it's evidence, should be evidence for us that, that John knew his purpose in life and that was to declare Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Lamb of God. It was about J John's ministry, his entire point of existence, I believe, in John's ministry was to call attention to the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And it ought to be a great reminder for those of us who are leading others spiritually, how are we leading them? Are we leading people in such a way that the focus of leading them is about ourselves and about who we are? Is that our focus? Our, our, and if it is, my friends, I would promote to you today that that is not about leading people spiritually. When the focus of your gathering is about you, that is a problem. That was not John's point. That is our point. If leading people is about a person, we have a problem. But I'm here to tell you, if, if, if your goal is to make disciples of Jesus, you are doing exactly what you ought to do. Because everything, as you lead others, you ought to be pointing them away from yourself and you being the object and pointing it onto Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. So for us today, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to follow Jesus? Now certainly, I, don't, I, I believe it's not merely about adhering to certain lifestyles or certain doctrines only. Now, without a shadow of a doubt, when a person begins to follow Jesus, I would be the first to say that lifestyles begin to change. That's a result of following Jesus faithfully. And I would, I would also say that, that, that as a person continues to learn and follow Jesus, uh, our doctrine begins to get clearer and clearer about what the Bible truly says, how we come to salvation and how we walk in the Lord. So those are important, no doubt. But most importantly, I believe uh, to be a Christian means that you follow and believe in Jesus Christ, the Word who has been revealed right here to us even this morning. And one of the ways we do this is by following His commands, learning His Word, following His commands that are found in the Word of God, in the Scriptures. Now, no doubt it's important to Jesus how we ought to follow Him. How do we know this? If you look at our text this morning, in verses 38 to, to 40, we see... <laughs> We see how important it is to follow Jesus. Do you catch what happens? Okay, so we've got John's disciples and they left following John and they started following right behind Jesus. And we see right there in 38, it says, Jesus turned and saw them following. Do you catch what he says? He says, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? Now, Whenever we hear Jesus' words, oftentimes, at least from, probably for many of us in many years in my life, when I would hear Jesus' words, I'd kind of take them at surface value. You know, you know, when he asked them here, you know, he asked Andrew and the other disciple that was following, he says, okay, so, so what are you seeking? Well, Andrew and the other disciple says, the end of 38 says, so where are you staying? That's what they thought he meant. And in a very surface level, I think that's certainly, um, you know, worthwhile understanding but i believe if you've followed jesus for any period of your life you recognize when jesus speaks something there is something far deeper for us to understand than than the surface level you know and i think the question that jesus asks his first two disciples what are you seeking is still very relevant to us to this day when it comes to following jesus ask yourself this question what are you seeking? Why are you seeking after Jesus this very moment? Some, some of you might be seeking after Jesus because you want some form of comfort in your life. Some of you might be seeking after Jesus uh, in some way you believe that uh, by seeking after Him, He will provide some form of prosperity or riches to your life. Or maybe you're, you're here this morning and you're seeking after Jesus because uh, you simply have heard that he could be your savior and so you want your get out of hell free card this morning. 
My friends, if that describes any of you here today, I hate to tell you this, but you're going to be really, 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 really disappointed. Why? Because following Jesus is certainly not about experiencing a, comfort, a comfortable life. I mean, Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 9, verse 23 says this, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. That doesn't have a bit of comfort to it, my friends. Let him deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever, Jesus says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. There doesn't really seem to be much about seeking after Jesus is going to provide comfort in your life. There doesn't seem to be much uh, at all about, in Scripture about seeking after Jesus is going to provide some form of prosperity or, or riches, no matter what some of the televangelists might say today if you turned on the TV. In fact, when we rightly understand God's Word, following or seeking after Jesus, if anything, provides the opportunity for every one of us to truly sacrifice. Not just our time, not just our talents, but to sacrifice our treasure for God's kingdom purposes. So if you've been seeking after Jesus for some form of prosperity or riches, my friends, it's, it's not here. It's, in fact, it's quite the opposite. The privilege and the opportunity, the joy that comes by, sell, by, by sacrificing our time, our talent, and treasure, and nothing less. Now, I see something else that's very interesting in our country and in other countries, and it seems as though there's another form of seeking after Jesus that has become kind of popular today, and I uh, and it, and it kind of goes something like this. I'm seeking after Jesus. Actually, I'm more seemingly seeking after a religion, or I, I might even say I'm seeking after a church. And the reason I'm seeking after that church is not so much about Jesus, but it is about how many go there or who goes there as some form of a status type of symbol. It, it is weird to me to see how that is happening, not only in our country, right here in our own city, but let alone across the world. My friends, you know, I don't think that's all that uncommon to what we see in Scripture either. There have been people in Scripture that sought after Jesus as a form of status. I'll give you an example. You might remember the story of two, two guys that are called Sons of Thunder. You remember the story? They came alongside Jesus. And what did they say? Jesus, okay, okay, who's going to be where? On the right, and who's going to be on the left in the kingdom of heaven? Do you think they really gave a rip about what Jesus was there for at that point? No. They were all about, man, Jesus, what kind of status can I be next to you? My friends, if you're seeking, by the way, um, it, the, the apple didn't fall far from the tree because if you remember in a, another gospel, uh, <laughs> uh, well, their mama did the same thing and Jesus, uh, mm, come on mama, right? So the apples didn't fall far from the tree. Uh, the sin passed itself on down from mama. But anyway, let me move on. Anyone, uh, falling after Jesus is not about getting a, some form of a status symbol next to your name. I believe there's many ways and reasons that people seek after and follow Jesus. But, but those that seek after Jesus in those ways that I've just described are going to be let down. Why? Well, Scripture makes it pretty clear. To seek after Jesus, there's a reason we ought to seek. And that is, point blank, very clearly, for the salvation of our sins. John declared it last week. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus himself said it in one of my favorite passages of Scripture called the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 16. Here's what Jesus said. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. We could say it this way this morning. Blessed are those who have experienced that their sins have been washed away. Blessed are those who have experienced the redemption that comes in no other name but Jesus Christ. Blessed are those who seek after Jesus properly, for they, he has promised, will be satisfied. 
My friends, the Bible is very clear. There's only one way to become righteous before God, and that is through Jesus Christ. There's only one way to become justified before God the Father, and that comes in a saving faith in Jesus Christ, seeking Him for the salvation of your sins. Paul says it in Romans 3.22, the righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So why are you seeking after Jesus this morning? Is it for comfort? Prosperity? Get your get out of hell free card? For status? Or is it to experience the redemption that is there in no other name but Jesus Christ? Blessed, my friends, are those who hunger and thirst for His righteousness because there's an incredible promise. You will be satisfied. That is why you seek after Him. Now there's another aspect of following Jesus. And it's becoming a learner of Jesus. Look at verse 38. When Jesus turned and he saw them following him, and he said these words, he said, so, so, so what are you seeking? Look at what their response first off is. They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher. Now a little bit of historical context comes into play here to understand what's going on. Now in ancient Israel at that time, it was very common for a rabbi to go around and select different disciples. Disciple meaning students or follower. That, that's what a rabbi would do is they would go and grab a, a, a recruit a group of, of, of young boys to follow in the very steps of that rabbi. In fact, it's oftentimes said in, in history books that, uh, that rabbis um, would have their students, their followers fall so closely behind that the dust of the sandals of the rabbi would fall upon the students. They followed so closely. They walked in the way that their rabbi walked. They listened to every word that their teacher instructed them. Like those early disciples, if we are followers of Jesus, we must too become learners of Jesus' word. We must learn to dedicate ourselves to the faithful study of His Word. And not only that, we need to learn it, but we need to become doers of His Word as well. I love how Jesus responds to His first disciples in in 39. When He says this, He says, Come, and you will see. Come, and you will see. And I believe he's still saying that to you and me this morning. He invites us to come to his word. He invites us to take in and and absorb his word into our lives and to to understand it and not only understand it, but to believe it and then to let it come out out of who the very core we are as Jesus followers. In fact, so much so, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16, he says this about the Word of God. He says that all Scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. In fact, the Scriptures tell us that the Word of God is living and breathing and active. And so what we do as faithful followers of Christ, we become learners of his word. And when we learn his word, it is living and breathing and active. And it will transform us from the inside out. And so Jesus looks at his first disciples and he says, look, why don't you come and see? Why don't you come and see my living, breathing word? Why don't you come and see who God truly is? Why don't you come and see what Jesus, what he has actually come to do to save you from your sins? Why don't you come and see? And with that invitation, look at what the first disciples did. It says they they followed him. It says uh, they saw where he was staying and they stayed with him. Verse 39 says, they stayed with him that day, for it was about four o'clock in that afternoon. And as a result 
of Andrew and this other disciple. And some scholars, by the way, if you're wondering who that other disciple is, uh, scholars debate this. I fall probably more into the camp of, of John, the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John. Probably a pretty good chance that it was John the Apostle that was with Andrew that were the first ones uh, to follow Jesus. Um, we can debate it, doesn't really matter, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to understand. But look at what happens. Coming out of verse 39, what Andrew heard after he stayed with Jesus for the rest of that day, verse 41 shows the result of that time spent with Jesus. And it says here, he first, Andrew, he first found his own brother, Simon. And look what he said to him. He said to Simon, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. We have found the Messiah. Can you imagine just for a moment how excited? Think of what Andrew's countenance must have been like after he spent that day with Jesus. Man, I got to go tell. Who am I going to tell first? I got to go tell my brother, Simon. He's going to be amazed like I am. Oh, he says, oh, we've been invited to follow him. We've been invited to come and see you know, as I look at, as I look at Andrew's response uh, to spending that day with Jesus, I had to ask myself this question. Am I as excited some 2,000 years later? Am I, am I nearly as excited about spending time with Jesus and His Word like Andrew was 2,000 years ago? Ask yourself that question this morning. What consumes your minds? What consumes your thoughts? Does it look anything different than, than the amazing excitement that comes from spending time with Jesus? Is that the kind of excitement that you experience every day that we have the privilege of, of not only learning and growing in Jesus, but we have the privilege to invite other people along with us? Does that describe you this morning? John 17, verse 3 says, And this is eternal life, that, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. But my friends, know this. Knowing Jesus will change your identity. You know how I know that? Look at verse 42. Excuse me, 40, yeah, 42. So here we have Andrew, and he just brought his brother to Jesus. And it doesn't say anything about Andrew saying, hey, Jesus, this is my brother Simon. All it says is, it, verse 42 says, he brought him, Simon, to Jesus. And then we get to see this amazing thing. Jesus does the once over, right? Jesus looked at him. He's like, ah, yeah. Yeah, you're Simon. You're Simon. You're the son of John, right? Okay, I got gotcha. you. Look at what Jesus does in verse 42. He says, you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter, or what we understand as, which means the rock. You know, there's an interesting thing about this. There is no explanation in all of the Gospels why Jesus actually changed Simon, Simon's name to Peter. But I will propose to you this morning, it really isn't the point of why Jesus uh, changed uh, Cephas' name or Simon's name, uh, excuse me, Simon to Cephas, which is Peter. I think the point is this. Jesus has the authority to give whatever name He pleases to Him. Jesus has the authority to determine Simon Peter's destiny. And every bit of it is for the glory of God. In fact, my friends, Jesus has the authority to give you and me, whatever name he wants as well. And Jesus has the authority to determine our very destiny, every one of us. And my friends, I'll propose to you this morning, that is where you want to be, is in the center of where Jesus wants you to be. You know, Scripture tells us in Revelation 2.17 that we're all given a new name. Uh, here's what it says. To the one who conquers, I will give him some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone and with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Let us not miss 
Jesus' authority here in verse 42. Jesus had the authority to change Simon's name to Peter. Jesus had the authority to change Peter's future to become the cornerstone of his church. And we all need to be reminded that there is absolutely no better identity and future than the one that Jesus has for every one of us. Now, in a very practical way, I don't want us to miss how Jesus gathered his initial followers. First, I want to just go back up for a moment and see how the first ones began. And it came because of a faithful and obedient Christ follower named John the Baptizer. And he was faithful to point others to Jesus. So much so that he had taught them about the coming Lamb of God so that when they heard him declare, they knew exactly that is the rabbi, that is the teacher, that is the Messiah, that is the one that is sent by God. We must go and follow him. But it doesn't end there. One of the first ones he sent or he pointed Jesus to was Andrew. Andrew went and followed him. And then Andrew goes after spending that day with Jesus and he finds his brother Simon Peter and he invites him to come and follow. And then Jesus, in verses 43 and 44, Jesus finds Philip and says to him in verse 43, he says, come and follow me. And then in verses 45 and 46, Philip in turn goes and finds Nathanael. And Philip Says, to the, says this to, to Nathaniel. He says, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And he says in verse 46, Philip says to Nathaniel, Come and see. There's two key things that I think we see happening in our passage this morning. First, the disciples invited others to follow Jesus. There was a very clear intention by these followers of Jesus to invite other followers of Jesus. And secondly, the ones that were invited to follow Jesus were those who were seeking after him. Let me clarify that statement before you think I've gone off the seeker bandwagon. Let me, let me just say this for you. Verses 36 and 37. Look, John the baptizer, he proclaimed, Behold the Lamb of God. His own disciples were following him, but they left to follow Jesus. Andrew told his brother, We have found the Messiah. Get it? He's pointing him to Jesus and he brought him to him. Philip finds Nathaniel, says, We have found the one that Moses and the prophets and the law talked about. Come and see. Every one of them were invited, and every one of them had been looking for him. There's incredible good news for us today in light of this passage right here. There are still those that are looking for Jesus. And I bet if we look around, not just here this morning, although there are those that are looking for Jesus here today, I have no doubt. But if we look around in our neighborhoods, we look around in our small groups. We look around at our, at our work, in our extended family, and all their friends. I bet we will see that there are people that are looking for Jesus today. If you looked, you could see deeply into their hearts that they are finding the emptiness that this world has to offer. They're hurt. They're broken. They're empty. They're needing the hope that can only be found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The other good news, it's two parts. The first was, there are still people looking. The other good news is, you're still breathing. What do I mean by that? Well, you're still breathing. So you are able to invite others to join you as you're following Jesus. I don't want us to miss this because uh, there's some stuff here between Philip and Nathaniel. We're going to run out of time to really dive into the remainder of this text this morning. But there's a really interesting interaction between Philip and Nathaniel. And, and, and you know, there's like, how could anything good come out of that city? I mean, there's a little city rivalry or something going on there. And there's, you know, and, and the rea- how could it be? The rea- Man, I think Philip is responding to Nathaniel's like, look, just come and see. I don't know how anything good can come out of there, but just come and see. I don't have the answers to everything about Jesus, but come and see. Join me as I am following Jesus. 
Friends, let me tell you, one of the best discipleship statements you can make when somebody asks you a question that you don't have the answer for is, I don't know. But let's come with me and see. I don't know. I don't know. But come and, come and see. I'm on this journey too. One of the best answers. Does anybody here feel like they've got all of the scriptures figured out? Right? Okay, if any hands are coming up, I was going to have a conversation with you. I couldn't wait to learn from you. But right? my friends, yours truly is on a journey of coming and seeing. 46 years old, I got a lot to learn. When somebody asks me a question that I don't have an answer for, do you know what? And it sounds weird coming out of a guy with the title pastor, but you know what my favorite response is as a pastor? I don't know. Let's figure it out together. Let's study the Word together and let's see what God will reveal. I'm here to tell you, I don't have it all figured out. All I can tell you is I'm redeemed. You know, we call this discipleship here at Timberline. I've read numerous different descriptions or definitions for the term discipleship. Here's one of them that I have read, and it says it goes like this. Proclaiming Jesus and leading others to a personal relationship with Jesus, helping them to grow in their Christ-likeness, and to in turn invite others to do the same. Not too bad of a definition. I like to read a lot about discipleship. It's part of my DNA. I love, I've poured the majority of my ministry years into discipling men, women, and children in the ways of Christ. And by the way, one of the best ways to grow is by putting yourself into a discipleship role. Because <laughs> the, the, the I don't knows become the I'm going to figure it out as we journey together. It's a really good place to put yourself in because you're reliant upon Jesus to reveal himself to you as you study his word. Uh, one of the books that I uh, have enjoyed reading comes, it's titled The Trollus and the Vine by uh, authors Marshall and Payne. And they say, this is what a disciple is to, to them. They say, to be a disciple is to be a slave of Christ, to confess his name openly before others. And then they continue it by quoting Matthew 10. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who's in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. And they go on to, uh, by saying this. The call to discipleship is thus a call to confess our allegiance to Jesus in the face of a hostile world, to serve him and his mission, whatever the cost. So we could say it this way. The Great Commission is the basic agenda for all disciples of Jesus. To be a disciple also means you are a disciple maker. Something that needs to be very, very clear here at Timberline. And that is from the very beginning. I've been here since the, the very first meeting. The very core, or I'm going to call it granite. You don't mess with granite, okay? Granite is hard. It's core. It's foundational, right? Some of you have granite countertops. You get that. You drop something on it. There's something that you drop on it's going to break. Your granite's not going to, right? One of the granite pieces that, that, that are part that is part of the DNA of Timberline is and will remain to be discipleship. Period. It's what we do as we love Jesus and we love others and we serve the world together. And since discipleship is granted here, we want to offer different ways for each and every one of us to become involved in, in a discipleship relationship. Let me give you a few examples of what we do and how we do that here at Timberline. Um, uh, number one, Sunday mornings. We still live in a culture here in North America where people are willing to come in, if they're invited, to come in on a Sunday morning for a worship service. This is a first step into a discipleship relationship. It's where people learn what it means to actually worship Jesus. It's a place where they get to hear the word proclaimed and exposed directly to them. It's a first step into a discipleship relationship. 
Number two, you, one of the ways that you could grow in your discipleship is to invite somebody into one of your small groups. Small groups here are foundational here, and they will continue to be core and foundational here at Timberline. Small groups, if you're not involved in one, there's a lot of incredible things that happen in and through a small group. One is that you can meet and make deeper friends. Another is it's a great place to ask questions and to study God's word together with others who may even answer it with you. You know, I don't know that answer. But together, we can figure it out. So in small groups, you grow in friendships. You deepen in your friendships. You grow in God's word by the studying of God's word. And not only that, but you get to apply God's word. And honestly, I have to tell you, I wish, I would love to see where 100% of Timberline, those who call Timberline home, were actively involved in a Jesus-focused small group. I would love to see that. In fact, in the time ahead, one of the things that, I'm, uh, that I have offered as part of our strategy of continuing to disciple our small group leaders is to have a couple of nights uh, out of the month where we're going to open up our home for small group leaders to come right to our home and, 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 to, and to have an opportunity where they can learn and grow as small group leaders so that they are even better equipped. Uh, many of our small group leaders, certainly we have men's groups and women's groups, but we have couples that are leading small groups. We want to raise the bar of the understanding and the equipping of the husbands and wives that are discipling you. So we're going to open up our homes uh, each month for those small group leader couples to come in and to be equipped. My wife and I will be doing the equipping, the discipling in our gatherings. And it's also going to be a great place for the small group leaders to process what they don't know or ways that they need help. It's a form of coaching we must do in order to encourage and equip our small group leaders to lead you even more effectively. So, if you're, if you're not leading a small group but you're part of one, I want to encourage you to talk to your small group leaders about going to those coaching huddles that are in our home here in Urbandale each week, or not each week, each month, excuse me. Small groups are that important. Now, small group leaders, I just want you to know it's not a requirement that you show up. I get it. You have a life. You have family. All that's I get it. But there are going to come times as small group leaders. These are optional gatherings, certainly. There are going to come times where you need that encouragement. Uh, you need that equipping. And that's why we are doing what we're doing. Other things, other ways you can enter into discipleship relationships here at Timberline is uh, our amazing Grays. I think that had an amazing gathering yesterday, and I, I think we heard from Gary Higby yesterday, and, and, and to be educated is safety in the home, and, and uh, it's a great place to enter, to meet relationships, meet other people, and to begin a discipleship relationship. We, other have, we have other social gatherings as well. Another way, now if you're not ready to step into a small group yet, here, I'm going to give you this recommendation. Starting next Sunday, we have two elective classes that are beginning. One's called Kingdom Life. Uh, there, we're, there's a 10-minute party afterwards. Uh, Joel Jernstead's going to be teaching that. I will, um, I have to, I'm standing in for him today. He has to be out today. Uh, if you have any questions on it, stop in the coffee shop and ask me about Kingdom Life. If you, if you want to know the gospel more clearly, plan to sign up today for Kingdom Life and show up next Sunday morning, 815, room number 5. Okay? Uh, that class is foundational for you. It's a great place where you can learn the word, you can meet other folks on the journey, and then see where God leads you. Maybe you'll be ready to plug into a small group, uh, let's just say in January after Christmas. Or you might want to plug into uh, the, the class that Max Godsey is going to be teaching called Foundations. I, I simply call it Foundations of a Christian Walk. Uh, that also starts next week, and you'll learn basic principles of how you ought to walk this Christian walk. And of course, I'd be remiss to not talk about Ultimate Journey, uh, the new phase one that will launch in January coming up. Whatever it is, wherever the Spirit of God is prompting you, I want to invite you, step in towards a discipleship relationship. My friends, everything we do here at Timberline is in groups. Now, why do we do it that way? There's two really good reasons. Number one, do you see how Jesus did his ministry? He did it in groups. And number two, that was so foundational 
to Jesus' life and ministry that we even see. If you're familiar with the book of Acts, we see the very first church of Acts. This is exactly what they did as well. Acts 2 says this uh, of, the, of the first church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which is the word of God, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. Day by day they broke bread together in their homes. They received their food and, and with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the result coming out of Acts 2 is simply this. It says that the Lord added to their numbers day by day those being saved. So why do we at Timberline do everything in groups? Very clearly, because the scriptures show us. That's how Jesus did it. That's how the first church did it. Therefore, we are designed to do the same thing ourselves. So as we close this morning, I have two thoughts for us. Number one, for those of you who walked in this morning uh, as a believer in Jesus Christ, ask yourself this question. When was the last time that you invited someone else into a discipleship relationship with you? When was the last time that you invited someone uh, to, to come on a Sunday morning? Or when was the last time that you invited someone to, to, to come to your small group? When you look around and you see those that are living and, and, and lost in this, and dead and dying in this world around us, and you see the Spirit of God moving on them, man, we ought to be, as Christ followers, incredible inviters to those who are seeking. Why don't you do that this week? Begin to invite someone into a discipleship relationship, be it a Sunday morning, invite them to come, invite them to your small group, invite them somewhere into a relationship with you. And lastly, if you walked into, uh, into here this morning and you had not yet professed Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life, I've got to ask you this. What do you say about who Jesus is now? Who has he been revealed as to you this morning? Listen to these ways that Jesus was described between verses 35 through 51 this morning. John the baptizer, this is how he declared Jesus. This is how he revealed the word of God. This is how he revealed who Jesus was. He said, behold, the Lamb of God. Now look at Andrew. Andrew declared, we have found the Messiah. Philip said, we have found him of whom Moses and the prophets wrote in the law. Moses wrote in the law and the prophets wrote about it. Nathaniel said farther on in our text for today that we didn't have a lot of time to get into, but he declared these words, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You walked in here this morning not knowing Jesus. He invites you today. Come and see who he is revealed to be. Will you come to Jesus this morning? Will you become his disciple? Will you repent of your sins and place your life in his hands? Let him change your identity. Let him change your destiny. For there's no other better place to be than in the hands of Jesus Christ the Lamb of God, who has taken away the sins of the world. And may you, when you leave here today, after you spend some time with him this morning, may you go from this place and proclaim him boldly and humbly to the world around us, to the world around you, who need to know who he is. This Jesus, my friend, he paid it all for you. And for me. It's the reason we gather this morning. And so this time, this time that we have set aside before we, before we close today, part of what Jesus gave for his disciples to do regularly whenever they gather together. And this time is only for those who know Jesus Christ and proclaim him as the Lord and Savior of their lives. So if that does not describe you, if you came in here a non-believer, you're still a non-believer, we're just going to invite you to let the, let the cup and let the bread pass by. 
But for those of us who proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior of our lives, this is a time where we come together as a body and we recognize the, his body and his blood that was put upon that tree. And so in this time ahead, the worship team is going to sing, uh, Jesus paid it all. And I just invite you just to come before him this morning and prepare your hearts to receive the Lord's, the Lord's uh, table and hold on to the elements as they are passed and after the song is sung and we've had time with the Lord this morning. We're going to partake in the elements together. So go ahead and hold the elements and we'll come back together. Let's go ahead and pass out the elements. And I hear the Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Child of weakness watch and pray Find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all All to him I owe Sin had left tells us on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he has his disciples gathered around him. I mean, just think about it. Some of these men we've talked about this morning were gathered at, 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 at around the table with Jesus. And he said, look, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this. As often as you're together in remembrance of me, let's partake. And yet again, that same night, he took the cup and he passed it amongst his disciples. And he said, well, this is my new covenant that is being found and being done in the shed blood of him. And he said, I'm doing this for you. That's my paraphrase for you this morning. 
He poured out the blood, his blood, as a new covenant for us and the redemption of our sins. Do this as often as you are together in remembrance of him. Let's pray. Father, <laughs> we think over our time in the Gospel of John, just in this amazing first chapter. <laughs> and you said in John 1, 14, the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. And today, in our text for today, Lord, you revealed to us time and again the one, the Word, who became flesh. The Word was revealed to us as it was revealed to these men 2,000 years ago. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for revealing yourself to us this morning. Lord, take us from this place. Let us be the kind of people, the kind of faithful Christians that go out and proclaim the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. We proclaim and we invite others who may be seeking and hurting and broken. We proclaim you to others and what you have done. And we invite them into a relationship with us as we point them to a relationship with you. Lord, we pray that this morning in the declaration of your word, you have glorified yourself in this place. We ask these things in the powerful name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. You're going to close us off in a portion of the song? All right, let's close in this, in this closing song. can have a seat. We have uh, 
Yeah. Tom Kehoe coming to give an announcement. Yep, in the heart of keeping us informed, the body informed and communicated with uh, uh, things going on. Two minutes, if you're a guest, check out for this next two minutes and we'll go to our fellowship time. Uh, or you can tune in, either way is good. Uh, Tom is one of our elders and he's going to kind of give us a, just communicate with the body kind of updates on where everything's at. So take it away, Tom. Good morning. I uh, was asked to give an update um, from the elders today. Uh, as you, many of you know, uh, we're considering giving considerations for our Timberlines 2017-18 budget. We continue to pray about that. We continue to talk to many of you, uh, answering questions about that that you have, um, and we appreciate that. And we ask uh, any of you that have continued questions, need any clarifications, uh, about the budget, uh, please come and talk to come and talk to me. Come and talk to any of us elders. And we'd be glad to try and answer your questions. It's very healthy. Uh, next Sunday, uh, we will have a proposed budget available here at the church for all of you. And so, be sure to come and and get a copy of the of the proposed budget. Um, and I want you to know, um, I'm treasurer here on the elders. And uh, there is uh, cash flow needs. Last uh, Sunday, um, Rick uh, Bixenman communicated a need of cash. Would you prayerfully consider with me uh, giving towards uh, a cash? We need cash. We need some money in the checking account to take care of ministries, to take care of our needs. And we have a goal of $20,000. So I'd ask you and your family to, to consider that, to pray about it, pray for it. Ask me questions about that. Ask any of us elders questions about that. Um, so then on October 8th at 4 p.m., we're going to have a meeting to uh, vote on the budget, to discuss the budget. So please uh, mark that on your calendars. We'll continue to communicate that. Uh, so October 8th at 4 p.m., we'll have that meeting. Please seek out any of us elders if you have any questions. I'll be here after church. Uh, send me a note. Call me. Do whatever. Whatever. So, thank you. Um, let's enjoy our fellowship time together. And uh, remember the 10-minute party about Kingdom Life going on Missio Day. And we'll see you next week.